Well, good morning. I'm Lawrence from Lawrence Poirier from Kenyu Housing here in Winnipeg. Uh, I think the, the how we how we operated has now changed, and I'm, I'm wondering how everybody else is kind of dealing with some of those day to day things that we used to do, um, simply as unit inspections. Or is anybody doing unit inspections? If they are, how are they doing them? Uh, how are they training their staff to to go into uh, units, occupied units? Most of my most of my families are in houses, but I do have some small apartments. Um, we're just kind of winging it. I would guess you're not alone in that. Uh, okay, I'll put that on the agenda and we can chat about that. Um, anything else to add to the questions? No, I think, you know, somebody else's questions leads to another question. Yep. All right, hmm. uh, James, who you are, where you're from, and any sort of challenges or questions that you have for the group? Uh, James Heinrichs from Winnipeg Housing. Um, I guess, yeah, the, as Lawrence said, uh, you know, we're in, a, we're in a different world right now as to how we do business. I think our challenges, um, we've got close to 30 office staff, uh, is trying to get everybody, first of all, um, you know, a certain amount working from home because the last thing you want is an outbreak uh, taking place and losing all 30 of your staff being, uh, uh, have to self-isolate for 30 days, uh, or sorry, for 14 days. Uh, so you don't want that to take place. So that's one of the challenges that we have is, is uh, you know, still trying to get our jobs done, uh, especially with our property managers. Uh, one of the things I'll comment on what Lawrence said is, is we uh, we are doing uh, we are doing suite inspections. Uh, we're going into that. Uh, we've uh, not that we have a written protocol, but the staff have all gone through their training on what's required for them. Uh, required to wear masks, uh, hand sanitization, uh, hand washing, all of those things between suite inspections, uh, social distancing, practicing that. Uh, the big question I think I sent this to you, Christina, for us is uh, still. The aspect of people because our our corporate office is open um obviously because of the social housing aspect uh we have a lot of people that either don't have bank accounts uh, they have to come in pay by cash those types of things uh, so we've set up protocols for all of our uh, staff on when each tenant comes in uh, or inquiry comes in about cleaning uh, all of those types of things but the big one is uh you know contractors coming in uh, we have a lot of contractors that uh, come in for getting keys and things like that We've now required any contractor uh, or um, anybody that comes into our office, I mean into our office, not the, the, not the waiting area, that they have to wear masks, things like that. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a challenge of us moving forward. Okay, so we'll chat about masks and people coming into the office with masks. I know that I saw that as a question as well. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Melody, and I'm at West Senior Housing Co-op in Brandon. Um, we have two buildings here. Um, so we have a little bit uh, tighter restrictions just lately with mandatory masks and whatnot. And we I haven't lifted that in the buildings yet, in the common areas, um, just because I kind of want to see what everybody else was doing. Um, but everybody's complying. Um, also, to have mini coffees in the morning. Uh, many being 10 people, uh, six feet apart, uh, with masks on, obviously, and take the mask off to drink their coffee. But everybody's been very um, uh, receptive to everything. Um, there's a few naysayers, but I think that's in every crowd. Um, challenges we did are our infections. Um, you know, we've been, the staff and I have been wearing masks long before they were made mandatory. Um, throughout the building. So um, I think everybody feels comfortable with our maintenance manager going in and doing the inspections and whatnot. Maintenance has been um, more if it really has to be done, he'll go in and do it, but if it's something small that can wait, uh, we're keeping a pending list for that for hopefully when things are a little bit better. Thanks, Melody. You were breaking up a little bit, but so from what I uh, heard is that people uh, that uh, 
um, your because uh, Prairie Mountain Health, of course, uh, had uh, required masks uh, in most, uh, I think, in all public spaces. So people are doing that. That you're having the coffee uh, in the morning with about ten people with distancing. Um, people have been mostly receptive to wearing the masks, and staff are wearing them as well. Um, so where do we want to start on uh, so uh, on unit inspections? Uh, so James sort of said uh, that um, that there is there's been general training for staff that they're uh, that they're wearing masks within suites, uh, washing hands in between, social distancing. Um, Lawrence had a question about sort of dealing with uh, tenants if they're in the units. I think are there. Um, Lawrence, what are what are what have you been doing in terms of sort of unit inspections and uh, staff going into uh, those units? Well, we've postponed unit inspections, uh, but it's not something that you could postpone forever. Uh, it's, I think it's very important. Uh, the uh, in the staff when we go, we're, we're trying to keep the maintenance, the involvement of maintenance staff is to a minimum. So we've kind of changed what we've got for priority. So, when, so we're not going into as many places as we were, but uh, so what we're doing is they're just, we're masking and sanitizing and that's about it. <clears throat> you know, we, we asked the tenants, we have a, a bit of a questionnaire for to ask the tenants uh, as, as does every, every place almost. Uh, and then we asked that they give us some distance, give, they give us room to work, keep the children away you know, from, from the employees. Mm -hmm. A little hard in the house, but we're not we're, we're not doing big jobs in people's houses. It's it's uh, just what needs to be done, and that's all. That makes sense, I, James. You were saying that people are going into suites. Are they uh, they are doing uh, sort of the regular inspections? That right. So, yeah, like you know, whether there's if there's concerns brought up, uh, you know, hoarding those types of things uh, that we obviously would go in. Uh, we've also started with our uh, regular inspections as well. So. Um, we staff also have uh, a list of questions that they're asking the tenants if they're going in, if they are home, uh, whether any of them is exhibiting any of the signs or symptoms, um, those types of things. And then, of course, the same thing that Lawrence said uh, when they're going in to ensure that they're not getting within the six feet uh, barrier of, uh, of the uh, tenants and also that they ask uh, respectfully that the people stay away from them as well. So. Um, as Lawrence said, th this isn't something that, you know, we, we have to continue and, you know, especially with the October 1st changes coming up with evictions possible again. And I know that's, that's a whole another item that we could probably debate about whether it should or shouldn't be happening. But the, the re the reality is we have a new reality with, with people also taking advantage of what has happened and not, uh, complying with regular rules that should still be there. And so, um, you know, that that's going to be something that we have to move forward with as, as well so yeah we're still we're still doing our inspections we stopped for a while um again we're trying to um if it's if it's a very minor repair probably as lauren said uh, we're not going in and doing that they we have a list of uh, you know when things get better we'll be doing it but we're just doing the things that that we believe have to be done so you know if it's if it's just a tap that's leaking a little bit fine that's going to leak for a while but if it's something that's uh, you know that's necessary we have to do it because you've also got to protect your assets as well uh and you also had a so james you had a question about sort of about uh contractors and um office staff wearing masks <clears throat> are folks right. wearing uh i so c and i had a meeting with manitoba housing uh yesterday in a and they're what they've been doing for their um, it was their portfolio management team, um, but they have, uh, for example, they've done a lot around their room bookings for obvious reasons. So they have limits on the number of people that can be in a room, mm -hmm. making sure they're spacing. Um, and they, their staff team did all wear masks during the meeting, but they said that that's not, it's not mandatory. It's something that they sort of decide. So um, right. I don't know for your office staff, um, have they been, are are they wearing masks? So what we've done is, uh, so the the request um, the request for trades uh, contractors delivery personnel to wear masks came from our front reception area, 
uh, because the you know uh, when you come into the front reception area, that's one thing because we've got the we've got the barriers put up and stuff like that, the, the plexiglass and stuff like that. But sometimes they have to come into the office to sign out for keys, or there has to be a discussion that takes place. So we've requested the contractors to come in, and most of them are pretty good with that because uh, we gave them the heads up on that. The two front office staff, two reception people are wearing masks then as well. Um, and then for the rest of the staff, we've left that optional. Um, so for, for staff members, we've just tried to reiterate again that you, that you social distance as much as possible. Um, some of us have our own offices that are enclosed, so we're not wearing masks in there. But typically when we're walking around in the public areas, we're trying to put on masks as much as possible. But of course, that doesn't always take place because people forget and things like that. So... But the, the bigger area was just, um, you know, most of us work together on a daily basis. It's when those delivery people that have come in, where have they been, uh, contractors, you know, they're going into different places. So, yeah, it, it, it's, not, it's not a perfect science to what we're doing. Is that, would you say that's similar for you, Lawrence and Melody? I haven't opened up my offices yet. Right. So I don't have very many people come to the office and we usually stop them at the entrance way so they're actually not coming into the open space. Yeah, you have those yeah. two doors that makes it a bit yeah. uh, easier to do. Everybody that, everybody that enters our, our buildings have to wear a mask and they also have to sign in. Um, so I know who's been in the building every day. Good point. So you have a sign in. I can't remember your your office is you don't really have a front reception. How do you how are you getting folks to sign in? Um I have signage out in the front and uh, they there's directions and they have the A wear mask, B sanitize and C sign in. Oh, okay. So, yeah, and so they everybody's been very good. And also do I happen to have a camera right on that? So when I'm in my office, I can see, I can hear the door, and I can see if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and that's, that's about as good. I mean, after hours when I'm not here, um, you know, whether they do it or not, I guess it's an honor system, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's only so much anyone can do, but I think it's this, the signage and sort of creating that, uh, that expectation makes a difference. Oh, quick question. What, uh, what happens if they're not wearing a mask? If I'm here and they're not wearing a mask, uh, I give them a disposable mask. Okay. Uh, and they put it on. If it's a resident, uh, I'll give them one as well. Or they'll say, oh my gosh, I forgot to put it in the car. I'm going to go get it or whatever, right? So like I said, everybody's been really compliant and, and understanding. And I think they, they value the importance of it as well. So Melody, do you have in, and I am not familiar what your, what your areas uh, is like, like we have a, we have a door that you come through into a, like a, into a central reception area and that reception area, we only allow one person or let's say a couple or family in at a time. And, but that we have like they would have in grocery stores and stuff like that. We have the plexiglass up, stuff like that. So there's those barriers. What we also do is we also uh, after each uh, tenant comes in, the areas that are touch areas, so the door handle, the countertop, all of those things are sanitized between each person. So I, I guess one of the questions I'd have if they have to sign in, uh, do the people, do you clean the, like, do they have to use their own pen? Do you have a pen for them? Does that get cleaned each time? Because that's a, that's a touch area as well that I'd be concerned with. Yeah, no, we have uh, a pen there and then we have of uh, uh, the there. I mean, there's a lot of onus put on the people that are coming through, but hopefully at the end, they, they, they're they just as diligent as, as we want them to be. Like I said, it's a lot of honor system, Right. but, but if there was ever a means that we could do contact, contact tracing, at least mm -hmm. I have a list of names of people that have been in the building, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think for us, I, I don't think we would require because because the way our reception area is set up, I don't think we would set up uh, that they would require to wear a mask. But I, I really like the the contract tracing, you know, because we see 
we might see you know, 10 people in one day, or we might see 40 people in one day. So, you know, my staff isn't going to remember every single person that's come in. I guess we could look back at receipts and stuff like that, but it might be better just to get, get their phone numbers and, and who the person is just so that if something does happen, we, we have that record. And the, the sign in also includes visitors that come in the building. So all visitors have to sign their name and what suite they're going to. Right. I was at um, the Canadian Mental Health Association office. It was more than a year ago, so it was before this, but they have a sign-in system on a, uh, on a tablet. And I, so I don't know what, uh, what they actually used for it. it. I think it was a pretty simple app, but um, I guess you wouldn't want people touching the tablet all the time. So you'd want your staff to do it, but it was a really quick and easy way for people to put in their information because it remembered you each time. So if it's the, you know, if it's the first time, then of course they, uh, it takes a bit of time to fill in some details like phone number and stuff. Cause typing is, uh, takes a bit longer than writing sometimes. But after that, once you start putting your name in, it remembers you. So, uh, it may be something to, I'm, I would assume that people are coming up with these sorts of apps all the time. So it may be something for, uh, especially at a, if you have a reception desk, it may be something can, that could become useful over can you, time. Can you uh, check in with them, Christina, yeah. just to see what they may have is instead of looking for the apps, if they can let us, that'd be, that'd be a great idea. You know, I, I would be concerned. Yeah. Once, you know, if you can type it in yourself, uh, then you control that. If you have them typing it in, then there's a the whole aspect of cleaning it. It's just like we do with our, we have a lot of tenants that do uh, uh, debit payments. So we've got to clean that machine each time, uh, you know, after each use, no different than you do at a grocery store as an example. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll ask. Uh, it's, um, I don't know if they still have, I would assume they don't have programming anymore. So I don't know what they've done, but it was a, it was a very, it was mostly for like for fire safety, I guess at the right. time, but it was a, a pretty useful system. Mm -hmm. uh, so the other, uh, there weren't any other advanced questions. Uh, maybe we'll go through um, <clears throat> other, I, are there other questions that folks have that you want to raise or should we go, I have a few sort of points that I know we've often discussed. Uh, one <clears throat> uh, is around common spaces. I know Lawrence, you don't, I guess, do your apartments have no. common spaces? No. Laundry, laundry room, I guess, would be common space. Okay. Are there any uh, anything different that anyone's doing around uh, common rooms with respect to either cleaning, uh, distancing, contact tracing, anything? We're we're uh, we have a lot of our apartments have common spaces and stuff like that. Uh, again, our. Our caretakers, maintenance staff are doing additional cleaning on contact points, things like that. Um, but, you know, we're obviously you can't, uh, you know, we when we're running programs, we're running with, you know, no more than X amount of people uh, for a program. Uh, tenants are really good with that. But we've also reminded tenants that, you know, there, there's obviously no way that we can clean absolutely every area that somebody is either touching or moving towards. So we really try to educate the tenants on, you know, it's, there's certain things we can do, but there's certain responsibilities that they have to have. And again, it's the physical distancing, not touching things, not putting your hands to your face, those types of things. And quite honestly, it's, it's a, it's a crapshoot, like whether somebody abides by these things or, or listens to them or not, um, you know, and that's, and that's the difficult thing going forward is, you know, I think somebody said that earlier on, you know, some, most of the, most of the tenants are, are uh, comply with what you want to do, but then there's those that just, you know what, it's really not a big deal at all. So. Yeah, there's only so much that you can do. Correct. Um, Melody, is there anything? So you're, you've been having the coffee hour that's been working uh, well, do you have any other sort of programming or uh, any sort of issues or changes with common space? Well, what I did is I took, we have a very large common room uh, with about 100 chairs in it. And so I took most of the chairs and put them alongside the, the walls and, and stacked them up and then pulled out 10 of the uh, non cloth chairs because if they're cloth, they're harder to, to disinfect. So all the cloth chairs are put away, and the, the ones that don't have cloth on them are out for coffee. 
uh, mm-hmm. in the in the area, and I face them out, and they're not move them because they're very notorious before they scooch their chairs closer and whatnot. So they've been pretty good with that. One thing that they were kind of everybody was, you know, we're 55 plus. Um, they haven't had a lot of activity, and I can tell that their um, mental health is kind of suffering, and and that uh, Thanksgiving is around the corner. So we have a lot of committees in a housing, housing co-op. So our social committee and myself, we're going to try to arrange some type of a Thanksgiving uh, dinner in the common room, but we're going to have it in shift. So then we can accommodate more people. So maybe three different times that they could come in and and eat their, their Thanksgiving dinner. And that would be prepared by the social committee in the kitchen in the common room and things like that. Just so people have a little bit to look forward to. And it really helps when they hear the, the rumors that we were planning this because Really, they're not going to go anywhere for Thanksgiving, and sitting home alone in in an apartment doesn't sound like a lot of fun either. So we're trying to think outside the box, yet still stay within the guidelines set by the health department. That's great. It's uh, it's always that chal- that challenging balance, right? Is it is it worse to do nothing, or is it uh, worse to sort of sort of take the take a small risk, but have a, have a meal together. So it sounds like you're finding a good balance there. Mm-hmm. Um, Lawrence, is there anything, so you have mostly sort of laundry rooms, uh, anything sort of new or different around sanitizing or, um, or dealing with sort of spacing there or any issues that you've heard of? No, not really. Um, houses are different. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We Uh, had uh, just, we have uh, some commercial areas in uh, some of our buildings. And so I know that uh, at Merchant's Corner, the old Selkirk Hotel, um, we have both CEDA and the University of Winnipeg there. CEDA actually went for um, additional grants and actually got them for cleaning purposes uh, because they do have a, a student base there and they're still running classrooms and stuff like that. So we actually did get, or they actually did get, and they're working with us on, uh, so basically every time there's a class, uh, once the class is done, the whole uh, area is is, uh, is sanitized. So for when the next class comes in, and of course the, 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 the touch surfaces that are used more frequently, elevators, uh, door handles and stuff are all cleaned more frequently as well. So that, that's been a positive thing. Uh, it's still, you know, there's still risks involved, but it's, uh, you know, a little bit better for the students at least, so. Do you know where the grants came from for that? Um, I could probably get you that information. I know uh, it was uh, uh, Tom Sims from um, CETA that, uh, that did, get the, uh, did get the grants, so. Okay, yeah, if, they're, if they are, like if it's from education, then it's unlikely many folks would qualify, but if right. it's a, sort of a pr- province-wide grant, then we would definitely share the information with folks. Yep, I can, I can uh, send you something uh, later today or tomorrow. Great. I had another, so last time that we had the call about a month ago, there was a question about fire drills. Um, and I just wanted to update folks. Um, I think I think Melody might've been the only one, or Lawrence, I think you were there as well. There was a question um, about fire drills. Um, uh, so I spoke with fire prevention and they did say uh, that it's, that. Uh, staff, especially if you're, I mean, they tend to focus more on this on supportive housing and assisted living. Um, but they did say to that staff should continue to have fire preparation and drills, um, but that they're not recommending them for residents if you can't have physical distancing. So stairways, for example, would likely not support physical distancing in an apartment. So they're not encouraging that or requiring that. Um, but did say, you know, make sure that you're providing as much information and preparing staff for fire drills accordingly. I don't know in a, I don't, I think that's only a requirement for assisted living. Is that not even, not even, not even assisted living supportive housing. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Supportive housing and up has is it's a requirement for, but assisted living. No. Oh, okay. So it's 
a limited number of folks. Yep. Um, okay, the, so then the next item on the agenda that we tend to talk about is staff and volunteers. Um, so it sounds like, uh, James, you've been preparing to try to prevent staff shortages with having um, having only a few people in the office at a time. Are there any other issues with sort of staff or volunteers uh, with shortages or um, with the return to school, any sick leave challenges or anything that we should be aware of or sharing information about? I think um, one of the questions I have, and I haven't followed up on this, I know that they were, uh, the federal government was gonna look at a, at a sick time allotment for through this whole process. I don't know where that's at, but I, I will tell you that uh, our sick time has probably increased through this by about 40% over the last number of months because um, I guess out of an abundance of caution, uh, we're telling staff that if you have, uh, you know, a couple of the uh, symptoms, uh, stay home until they go away. If uh, there's something further that they believe that it's COVID related, we're asking them to get tested, uh, wait for the test results, and then wait for at least 20, if the test results come back negative to ensure that they haven't had any symptoms for 24, or sorry, for 24 hours. So we're definitely seeing an increase in, in our costs. Now, um, our costs aren't aren't a bad because we don't replace these people. So there's no additional cost. It would be different in a personal care home, i.e. where you, if a staff member goes on sick leave, you have to replace them. Here, we don't replace the staff, but we're definitely seeing that as far as some of the workloads go then too, that they're, um, you know, some things are falling behind because they're not at work, so. James, Sorry. you're not limiting the amount of days of sick time though if they're away they're away and you, you you cover that cost um what so typically we they they all have typically they have a sick bank that they that they use um what we've done is is we've worked with staff like we have we only got x amount of additional dollars through that that one uh one process with government that twenty five thousand uh part of the payroll whatever component that was. So we put that towards the, um, that, that's a special fund that we've used, especially for COVID. So if we have additional dollars in there and somebody goes beyond the point, typically it's not a, uh, typically it's not more than about two days, Lawrence. So typically it's not, it's something that we can manage. If it goes longer than that, then we're requesting that they apply for, uh, for EI and stuff like that, because we just, you know, somebody's off for two, three, four weeks or something like that. We can't afford that out of a regular budget. Yeah. We've only, we've had where somebody is, they've, they're suggested to stay home because somebody they know was had contact. Right. They haven't had contact directly with that person. You know, so it's a couple of days of waiting for test results. Right. Uh, but nobody's actually been sick. Right. Uh, yeah. Do you, does anyone have, uh, we asked, I guess, a couple of months ago if anyone had sort of a written policy. I find uh, most people I've asked about this haven't actually written down a sort of an updated policy or procedure um, because it's sort of like a, an amendment to to your existing sick time policy or procedure. I don't know uh, if anyone does have anything written formally around uh, sick time and and sort of leaves of absence, or if you've been sort of dealing with it on a case by case basis. Uh, case by case basis, we because uh, we're part of a union. We have you know what the union agreement says, and so uh, but. It, it's a good point. We've we've kind of requested in discussion with the union to see if there's anybody, anybody else that has established, uh, you know, written policy around uh, COVID-19. So uh, we haven't done anything. It's uh, basically, if somebody has any of the symptoms, they actually call me um, and I'll make that judgment call instead of leaving it with my manager. So Yeah, the last, so Eden uh, had said that they thought they had something written down, but they, the, the staff uh, who were on a call, but they said that their manager has been sort of dealing with it case by case as well. Right. So I think that's, yeah. I think that's quite common. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, how do you, how do you write something when somebody is, you know, as an example, we've got a couple of them that probably, you know, 
are are way more cautious. Like I've got a little bit of sniffles and I've got a little bit of you know scratchy throat, and now I'm going to stay home because I think it's COVID related. How do you how do you say no to something like that? You really can't. Um, you know, I have allergies, so do I have a runny nose most of the time, right? You know, I get I get headaches as well. I get migraines, so you know, combine a runny nose and a and a my and a, and a headache. Well, those are two symptoms of COVID nineteen. So I should theoretically be staying home each time that happens, right? So. Yeah, it, it's a it's a difficult one to manage. Right. Anything else on staff and volunteers? If you do ever feel the need, so we ha we do have like people first is always available for sort of training sessions. They've offered to do one on accommodation, but they're quite expensive. So we need to have enough interest to make it worthwhile. Um, my sense from folks is that they're people are still pretty comfortable with dealing with things on a case by case basis um, that there isn't any specific training that would be valuable. But if you, mm -hmm. if there is something to uh, let us know. I, th I think this is going to, you know, we may need to look at that, you know, from a legal standpoint, future wise, uh, you know, right now we're still in the middle of it, but how, how long is this going to continue? And, you know, what type of challenges are we going to have, you know, six months from now, three months from now, a year from now, um, some staff may continue to, um, how, how would I put it? How would I put it without sounding negative? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll challenge the status quo. Uh, as we know that, you know, 5% of your staff will always do that. And these are the same five that now look at this situation as a, hey, you know what? I've got two days, sick days banked. I'm going to take them because I have this, right? It, it, be, it becomes just a more of a, uh, a management of of your staff than anything else not necessarily the situation but just the staff members that makes complete sense um yeah if i see any useful resources i'll make sure to share them there's also i think a lot of people are there's a lot more material coming out on managing remote employees and uh and remote teams those sorts of things because i think that's also um, even after this will be a common HR need. So if I, I think, I think that one is, I think that one is probably would be higher up on my priority list is, is managing staff at home. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to develop a checklist right now on, um, and again, it, it's, 95% of your staff, you'll never, ever worry about them working at home because they're going to be productive. It's that, that five or 10% that, what are they really doing and how do you quantify their workloads? Like, especially when you're dealing with, you're dealing with tenant issues and things like that. Um, you know, it's very easy when you're working from home saying I got, I got 15 or 20 tenant calls and that's what I was dealing with all day, but did they really get 15 or 20 calls, right? We don't know that. If I find anything good on that. Uh, and if anyone else sees any good resources, let me know. Um, supplies is the next thing we often talk about. I haven't heard of any shortages of supplies that folks are dealing with. I know, um, I was in a call. I don't know if it was our last call or another one. Someone was talking about sort of stocking up on PPE and getting prepared, just recognizing that it's fall and it's, uh, that things may change rapidly. I don't know if uh, if there are any sort of uh, issues with supplies that folks are dealing with or that uh, that we can help with. It would it would seem that there's a better supply right now. Um, getting inventory in is is I think a little bit easier right now. Uh, we've kind of taken the approach that we're we're gearing up for for a busy fall with a uh, you know further outbreaks and stuff like that. So we've we've actually started stockpiling some uh supplies so melody how about in brandon are there any uh challenges getting any supplies or are things sort of running smoothly now i think the only thing that is a challenge to get is the is the light hallway still. um even our, our we deal with progressive uh sanitation here and they even are challenged to to get the way so that's, that's, that's I think the biggest thing. The masks for the staff. Actually, I I ended up going on Amazon and ordering uh, like a case of twelve boxes. So the staff always has a mask, um, and I saved about fifty percent of what I would if I ordered locally. 
Yeah, Amazon is uh, a bit evil, but also it, incredibly convenient. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it's a good choice. Uh, so progressive sanitation uh, may uh, be low on Lysol wipes. I know stores are also tend to be out of wipes. Lawrence, for you, any supply issues, challenges? Supplies are pretty easy to come by. Great. Not cheap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, so then the next thing uh, on our agenda to talk about, there was a, a sort of tenant or resource needs. Um, so Melody talked about having, the, having a dinner for Thanksgiving. Are there other sort of tenant related needs or uh, tenant support ideas that folks have had? Anything that, uh, that um, we can help with for ideas or advocacy related to sort of tenant uh, challenges? Nothing new, sort of the regular uh, issues that have been going on since the beginning. Um, I did want to add, so we talked a little bit about RTB. Um, so RTB has, uh, the, the government is not going to renew the amendment to the Residential Tenancies Act. So rent increases will be, are permitted um, as of October 1, um, as will uh, eviction hearings can um, be permitted. Um, any issues with that, challenges, things that we should raise to RTB? What are folks doing about that change? James, you were saying that uh, you're, you're sort of thinking about, because I, I don't know if it's like, if typically if someone's behind on the rent, if your regular process would be sort of a, a, a notice, um, have you, are you changing that now that, uh, that RTB is open for hearings? We would, we would still, we've been going like through this whole process. We'll, we'll continue with the identical process we have, which is uh, if somebody is behind um, our property manager, we'll have a discussion with them first of all. Uh, then typically if uh, that doesn't work, uh, they'd get a letter where there, there's a required meeting with our uh, tenant resource coordinators to set up a repayment plan. Um, if they still balk at that and aren't willing to work with us at all, yes, we will start that process now on October 1st. Uh, but typically it, it's, you know, it's not something where if somebody misses a month and we're, we're kicking them out on the street or giving them an evicted notice. We, we actually, you know, try quite hard to work with them. But as you know, there's some tenants that, uh, you know, we, 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 we know that there's, you know, we have five or 10 tenants right now that will be given eviction notices where, you know, the money hasn't been an issue, but they've used the situation as a, a reason for not paying their rent and doing other things. So uh, that's the unfortunate part is, and, and I guess the other question that I'd have is, uh, you know, is, is government going to do anything for any of us where, where, you know, we've lost rents, those types of things. I, I guess the subsidy agreements require them if we're, if we have a shortfall to pay for our deficit. So that's going to be something there, but they're going to have to understand that that's going to be something that's going to be happening in some of our buildings. So. My arrears, our, our arrears situation is probably better than it has been in years, actually. Really? But I think that as, as um, time goes on for, as time goes on for uh, people have taken advantage of the CERB and there may be some clawback on that, that's where we're expecting some difficulties. Right. However, you know, my my history is still working with tenants to try and collect on a through mediation through through agreements so as long as everybody does what they're supposed to do we're not i'm not i don't have it i don't expect a big push uh if i looked at my arrears list today and uh for for next week i probably would have a handful of maybe five or six people who would who have taken advantage and i have one that's so bad that it's it's, it's she'll never recover Mm -hmm. uh, just and she just didn't do what she needed to do at all. So, yep. but out, out of all of, out of the four hundred and something houses, I only have five or six people and, and one person who's taken real advantage. But we I think we really have to work with these with this next group as as the Serb 
the changes, the, how it's dealt with, how EIA uh, regains that money back. Uh, there's, they're asking for uh, bank statements from tenants and trying to determine that they, whether they got the money and how they're going to do the payments and whether if they cut them off social assistance because they got served and how long that's going to, that's where the problem will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as those things happen, don't hesitate to let us know because we can sort of compile that information and send it up. I know groups like uh, Make Poverty History Manitoba um, have been uh, working with government to try to find a, a <clears throat> least punitive way of dealing with CERB and EIA issues, recognizing that like nobody wants to see a bunch of people become homeless because they got... Um, got the CERB. So uh, thinking about a way that they could at least have, you know, rent payments or something like that and, and be, and slowly repay those things over time. Um, so if there are issues, please do let us know. Melody, you're, sorry, go ahead. No, if you can deal with Melody first. Um, I was just going to say, so Melody, uh, your folks are uh, seniors. Um, have there been any sort of, um, income issues or issues with, um, and you're a co-op, so RTB wouldn't apply. Are you, as a co-op, are you going ahead with a rent increase or a um, housing charge increase? I, I think the plan is we're gonna wait until January uh, instead of October 1st because we can. That makes sense. Sorry, go and Lawrence, you are going to say something as well. Our tenants are responsible for their own utilities, and that's one of those is water. And so, and common sense would say that we're not going to turn off water uh, in the midst of a pandemic where washing is one of the most essential things to do. Uh, however, the, the water company has said we're not turning it off, but they've also said that our policy is that after 45 days, I believe it is, the bill will be added to our taxes. And then that tenant will not be responsible for that. And so then we end up with RTB, and make RTB making a decision. Uh, we can't stop from consuming it, but we, we're, at, we're gonna end up paying the bill. I have 10 tenants that are over $1,000 each. So it's a fairly substantial amount of money. That's for the water bills? For water bills. Yeah. Is that the similar for you, James? Well, typically water would be included in all of ours, uh, okay. with the exception of some of the homes that we manage and stuff like that. Um, there's another with the buildings that we've managed now with um, uh, for the uh, Manitoba housing is actually through uh, their program, they can actually go after uh, the tenants, like if there's uh, outstanding items. Um, and, and they can actually go through their uh, their taxes. So um, so we we have a, a, a number of different avenues too. And I just want to make sure you know clarify that uh, the, the the COVID for us hasn't made things a lot worse as far as collecting of rent. You know, with with eighteen hundred uh, almost nineteen hundred units, we always have you know probably ten fifteen that we're dealing with on on a on a monthly basis um and it's just part of our, our everyday business but but yeah we have seen some things change with COVID, and i i think uh we've also seen i think we had about eight or ten people that just came in in the last couple of days because they knew the regulations or they were going back to the same rules that they were before for october 1st and uh and our staff had already been working with them and, and reminded them that, you know, these are the things that are going to be happening. And unless you're going to do something, so the money, the money was, was there or, or a lot of it was there. They just kind of, well, how long is this going to go? We can hang on to it. Uh, those types of things. So. In Ontario, the nonprofit housing association, we ha were having a conversation a couple of weeks ago and they said, so they, I think it was September 1st that things uh, changed there for their um, landlord tenant boards. They said um, that there were huge, that even before coronavirus, there were huge wait times for hearings there. Um, and I think that was a concern, um, Lawrence, that you raised that um, once things do change, that hearing times will be um, uh, very long. I don't know if um, 
if you're still anticipating that, or maybe uh, if if that does happen, feel free to let us know and we can sort of raise that with, with RTB. I'm not sure that they're doing in-office uh, hearings. Um, a lot of them will be done over the phone, so that's, you know, that should move Make things faster. Along, hopefully. I know they're, uh, when the last time they, I don't know if it was from your um, newsletter or if it was directly from RTB, or maybe it was from PPMA, but they said they should be within about six weeks, should be able to get caught up with a lot of things. So they were going to put some additional staffing in. Of course, summer has gone too, so people aren't taking holidays, so they should be at a full staffing complement. Yeah, they did say that they could reallocate staff if necessary. Yeah. So they had other people that uh, that could be moved in to right. fill in. Um, okay, the next thing uh, I, I just wanted to sort of ask again, if there's any other financial impacts of COVID that we should be sharing with government. So I think the, the you know, uh, James, you've made the, <laughs> that for many, many providers, government will end up paying the deficit. Um, so that's something that they should be prepared mm -hmm. for. There's some folks that um, I think there are some uh, agreements where uh, that's more challenging to uh, collect than I think there are some fixed subsidy agreements. Um, are there other financial impacts of COVID just that we should be aware of and ready to advocate for? Just additional, I think that whole aspect of the additional sick time days. Yo, keep an eye out on the the throne speeches. Is that today? Today. Today. Yeah. today. So we'll see. I think they were going to, they have said that they'll make some announcements related to um, sick time at some point. I don't know if that will be now or later, but uh, I'll, I'll let you, I'll do a summary of anything relevant in the, the throne speech. Uh, which sort of uh, goes to the, uh, the other thing that I just wanted to remind people of if you didn't see it there aren't any there aren't many details yet but there was an announcement of 1.2 billion dollars for rapid uh housing so the government in uh, it's uh the announcement made it very much focused on uh, addressing homelessness but there is money available for um they're they're focusing on modular housing so they want something that can be built quickly um, or purchasing existing units that can be turned into affordable housing units. So if you've had your eyes on any properties or if you have any uh, any uh, developments that are sort of shovel ready or close to, then I would uh, uh, recommend getting ready for that. I'll definitely um, let people know as those details become available. Um, and we're hoping that there'll be more, uh, there's been, uh, consistent advocacy for an urban uh, and rural indigenous housing strategy as well. I don't, this, the government has been very slow and I don't, don't know that anyone's anticipating anything there, but uh, there is money for quick new development or purchasing assets right now. You'd have to be pretty much ready to go with a project to, in, in order, like at least from what I've read from it, you have to be pretty much ready to go to access those, those, those funds. So there might be people out there, but because typically, you know, your, your planning process around something like this is, is a lot longer than what that money is going to be available for. So you have to be ready for it. So. Yeah, I think it's been for, so some municipalities have, uh, have leased hotels on an, with an, uh, an option to purchase. So I think that will be um, sort of the first stage. Um, and then there, they are, the uh, minister Hussein is very keen on modular housing. He said, uh, we had a meeting with him and he's raised that a few times because I guess it's faster. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's <laughs> six months fast, but um, exactly. I'll uh, let you know as, as we get details on that. Um, so that was it on the agenda. If there's uh, the other thing I just wanted to ask is if there's any other upcoming challenges you're anticipating, education uh, needs, um, information we can share with you, um, or yeah, anything that we didn't cover today, we could go around. Uh, Lawrence, uh, any, any other things that you're anticipating, preparing for? 
education needs we can help with? No, I think I'm pretty good. James? Um, all sorts of stuff, but how, how do you do it now when you, you know, uh, we, we were planning an event for our staff on September the 11th, uh, but of course we canceled that just because we, we have to look at a different way of doing our uh, education for our staff. So it's going to be more on a, uh, doing a certain amount per, uh, per day um, instead of having everybody together. Um, I guess the only other thing is, you know, and, and not necessarily this relates to COVID-19, but it relates to all of us is, do we really know where Manitoba housing is going now with, you know, Joel leading the path and, you know, we, we have a meeting with the minister next week, Tuesday. So it's one of the things we're going to be asking is, you know, is, is there plan still to sell off assets? Um, and is there plan still to, uh, to put out RFPs for managing their direct managed buildings? And I, I don't the understand that I've met with Joe now a couple of times and I'm not sure if their plan is still their plan. Yeah, my sense is that it's similar to that they're they're waiting for proposals. The other, right. but I I did have a conversation with Joe a couple of weeks ago, and he said he does he is under pressure to accomplish something, but government hasn't said what right. that is. So right. <laughs> so there is if there's things that you want accomplished, it's a mm -hmm. good time to sort of put those in his ear so he can take right. credit and you can get what you what you need right melody for you any uh anything that we can support with any uh last questions for the group any education that we can support with no everything everything is good here great well thanks for joining us it's uh, i know it was a small group but i i find it helpful to know uh, what challenges you guys are having and I hope that uh, having some of these discussions with each other also is useful and worth your time. Um, I'll, we'll end at that then. Uh, thanks again for joining us.